This narrated PowerPoint is designed to help integrate your understanding about probability, distribution of sample means, and hypothesis testing. This presentation will make the most sense if you've already had the opportunity to read the workbook on these topics. To help us to go through and see how these topics are related, I'd like us to address the question, does lead impair IQ? Here's the dilemma. If you want to find out whether lead impairs IQ, and let's say your theory is that it will affect brain development, there is an ethical issue. It would not be appropriate to give people or children lead to see if it harms their IQ, right? We wouldn't want to do a, a treatment or a manipulation that would actually cause harm to someone. And yet, it may be very important to us to find out if lead impairs cognitive development because if it does, it would be very important to take lead substances that could get into the air, like that could give off lead dust, to take those substances out of classrooms. Okay, so we have a situation where we really would want to know the answer to the question, but it wouldn't be ethical to actually test people uh, to see if it has an effect. Our solution, we could find a group of children who were inadvertently exposed to lead and compare their mental ability to the population. And because paints uh, used to be lead-based, this would actually not be as difficult to do as you might think. Uh, research has now shown that lead does uh, negatively affect um, brain development. Uh, and there was lead paint on blinds that kids would suck on as little kids or uh, lead dust uh, in the air uh, where lots of lead paint was used and this has actually been shown to decrease IQ. So let's say our researcher has found a group of children where they're in an environment that had a lot of lead present and that these children for all other purposes were normal except for this one unusual uh, difference that they were in a lead based environment. When you're ready to develop your hypothesis concerning the relationship between lead and, and uh, mental development, you have to decide whether you're going to have a, a directional hypothesis, which is known as a one-tail test, or if you're going to have a non-directional hypothesis, which is known as a two-tail test. With the directional hypothesis, you're specifying whether the sample mean should be below or above the population mean. And so you see here two illustrations of a distribution of sample means. In one case, the uh, in the top case, the right tail is shaded in. This would be a directional hypothesis where you would uh, expect the sample mean to be greater than the population mean. For example, uh, we want to test whether a, a food diet will actually improve your weight gain for our sumo wrestlers. Uh, you know, some major carbo diet to really bulk them up, uh, you would do a directional hypothesis where you expect the sample mean to be above the population mean. Take a look at the bottom uh, illustration of a normal distribution, and there you'll see that the left tail is uh, shaded on the bottom side. And that directional hypothesis corresponds to where you would expect the sample mean to be below the population mean. That might be a diet where you're actually hoping to lose weight uh, and we would hope that the sample mean is below the population mean. So what the researcher is going to do when he or she writes up the research hypothesis is they're going to decide, am I expecting my sample mean to be above the population mean or below it? In our case, the research hypothesis is going to be that children who inhale dust, lead dust that is, uh, will have a lower IQ scores than the general population. So we're going to have a directional hypothesis Specifically, we're going to predict that our sample mean will be below uh, the population mean. Now, in addition to a, a one-tail test, that is a directional test, you can also do a, a two-tail test, which is known as a non-directional hypothesis. A non-directional hypothesis is where you want to cover both bets. You say, hey, I think the sample mean is going to be different than the population mean. 
Maybe it'll be above, maybe it'll be below, I don't know. I just think it'll be different. Okay, so that would be a non-directional hypothesis, otherwise known as a uh, two-tail uh, test. In our case, we're going with the one-tail hypothesis, that is a directional hypothesis. We're going to predict that the sample mean will be below the population mean. We have, in essence, placed our bet for what the results will look like. We have decided to do that over the other possibilities, saying that lead would improve IQ if we did the other one-tail hypothesis test, or saying, hey, I think lead will just have an effect. I don't know if it'll improve it or harm it, and that would be that, that two-tail hypothesis test. So we're going with the one-tail hypothesis test that lead would harm IQ. Okay, now, what we're going to be doing is we're comparing a sample to a population mean. So we need to pick the right inferential statistical test uh, so we can make this comparison and see what's the probability of, of our getting an outcome due to chance. For our particular research design, our dependent variable is an IQ score, which is a way to measure intelligence. We believe it will be affected by lead. Uh, IQ score is a scale variable. It is a um, interval scale uh, variable, so it falls within the scale. Uh, it's normally distributed, that is true, and we know the standard deviation. The people who design IQ tests actually designed it so that the standard deviation will be a particular value, uh, for example, 16. And that is going to allow us to do the z-test. So a z-test, we've done many of these in the past, uh, only it was known as a z-score, and we were comparing a single value to a population mean. Now we're, we're kind of going up to the, to the next level, and we're saying, okay, let's compare a, a sample mean to a population mean. Let's find out what's the probability of a whole sample having some average value compared to the population. If we're going to do a z-test, there are four basic requirements. Number one, are you comparing a single sample to a population? If so, you're at the right place. Number two is your dependent variable scale. It has to be scaled because that way you can see uh, what is the shape of a distribution. If it's nominal or ordinal, then we're just dealing with categories that at most can be ranked. So we actually need a scale uh, variable where there's equal intervals between the values. Number three, when we look at our distribution, um, the distribution of scores must be normal. Or, if the distribution of scores, uh, if the shape is unknown, or definitely not normal, we're still okay as long as our sample size was at least 1,000 or more people in it. Okay, so if the distribution of uh, population scores is normal, we're good to go, it doesn't really matter our, our sample size. On the other hand, uh, if we know that the distribution of our individual scores isn't normal, uh, then we need a sample size of at least 1,000, and then we're okay to use the z-test. And finally, the standard deviation for the population also needs to be known. And you may say, why? <laughs> why are all these requirements in place? Well, remember that with the z-test, we're going to be looking up uh, our proportion using a z-table. And just like with scores, uh, just as with uh, sample means, the z-table is only going to give us useful information if the distribution is normal. Uh, if it is not normal, we can still look up something in the z-table. It'll give us a proportion, but it would be wrong, right? Because the z-table is based upon that assumption. We have a normal distribution. We also need to know the standard deviation to know how wide is our distribution. Interestingly, you don't always have to know the population mean. Uh, in fact, later on this semester, uh, we'll talk about when we're going to compare a sample mean against a hypothesized population mean. But don't worry about that. Just know that for our z-test requirements, you got to have a um, normal distribution. You need to know the standard deviation uh, for it. And if you've got those two, uh, you're well on your way. Also, of course, we'd only do a z-test if we're comparing a single sample to a population, uh, and likewise if our dependent variable is scale. So that covers all four requirements. 
when I was talking about the z-test requirements, that illustration on the left, that would be a distribution of sample means. So this is a distribution where each value, instead of being a single score, actually represents a sample. Okay. Now you may wonder why, uh, if the z table requires the distribution be normal, why did I previously say, you know what, it doesn't matter um, the shape of the distribution of individual scores, you're still okay if the sample size is 1,000 or more. Why is that true? Well, there is one key theorem covered in statistics. And anyone who takes a statistics class is expected to know this key theorem. It's known as the central limit theorem. And you can read about it in the uh, workbook, but the main idea uh, behind it is that it doesn't matter what the shape of the distribution of individual scores looks like. If you uh, work, for example, with that bimodal distribution that's shown at the top, if you randomly sample 1,000 people from that bimodal distribution and you plot that single point, then you sample another 1,000 people, and then you plot another single point representing their average. And you keep doing this, sampling uh, 1,000 people, uh, recording a single point representing their average. By the time you're done with hundreds and hundreds of these samples, your distribution of all those sample means will appear normal, guaranteed every time. And that's why you can use the Z table, because you're guaranteed that the distribution of sample means will be normal. So if the individual scores are already normal, you're good to go. You don't need a sample size of 1,000 or more. If the individual scores are normal, the distribution of sample means will be normal. But if your distribution of individual scores is not normal, then if your sample size is at least 1,000, you're still okay. That distribution of sample means will be normal.